Depression is a mood or emotional state marked by sadness, inactivity, and a reduced ability to enjoy life. It can be marked by feelings of hopelessness or pessimism, fatigue or very little energy, uh, low self-esteem, and a sense of worthlessness. Now these feelings can lead to noticeably decreased activity, slowness in thought or action, uh, weight gain or loss, uh, suicidal thoughts obviously, and difficulty in making decisions. Now this last one, difficulty in making decisions, I find a little unusual. I mean, what would depression have to do with a problem in choosing what to do in your life? Well, according to the work of transpersonal psychologists, and even looking back on my own experience, I can see that it's this inability to make decisions that often gets us into a depression in the first place, and it's understanding this process of decision making that can get us out, and that's really what this video is about. However, in order to understand this decision making process, we need to take a deeper look at the development of our own consciousness. Okay, so looking at the history of the embodied human consciousness, um, wow, this is complicated. Maybe this chart's better. I'm happy if I get the cake, but I'm sad if I see a bird. What the fuck is that? Okay, well. Okay, this is Ken Wilber's model of consciousness that's a little bit easier to understand. And in this video, we're not going to get into all the details about what levels of consciousness mean what. But what's important to know is that there are different levels that we're dealing with. People living on this earth right now as adults that see the world in completely different ways. And very often, uh, we're all living in the same country together. Just giving a brief explanation from the bottom, archaic consciousness would be like a caveman, tribal consciousness is obvious, feudal consciousness, I prefer that word to warrior, is more like the kings and queens of 500 years ago or the Chinese warlord. Traditional consciousness would be like farming communities or the, the deep south of the US, the Bible Belt. Modernist co consciousness is obviously the consciousness of city life, scientific, rational, material, focused. Uh, Postmodern consciousness is more of what you find among university professors who are embracing concepts like diversity, fighting racism and homophobia at every, every stage. And then integral consciousness is a level that has a mystic awakening and recognizes the value of all of the other levels where usually the other levels tend to be fighting with each other. One level we won't be dealing with today is post-integral consciousness, which is a very high level of spirituality, which I think includes only three people, Jesus, Buddha, and probably Ken Wilber himself. Now, what's nice about this model is we can lay it out in seven stages, linearly, and all of a sudden we've got something that's clean and clear. And I think it's interesting to point out that this model also has parallels in the Hindu chakra system, as well as the Jewish Kabbalah. Now this development of our consciousness can last an entire lifetime and it's very common for one stage of our consciousness to take from five to seven years for it to fully develop and move on to the next one. And while we are moving linearly from stage to stage over time, once we're in a stage, there is this process of sort of regression and moving forward. At a stage four, we might have moments of stage three, then insights at stage five, which help pull along our evolution. Now, any stage of development we enter will start with a sense of newness and freshness and openness as if we are entering the world for the very first time. We'll start to enjoy this process and we will get attached to that level subconsciously and kind of feel like we finally got a mastery over the world we live in. However, when it's time to move on again, we'll get that sense of a fear of losing what we've got and we might want to hang on. We might not want to move on to the next level because things have worked so well in the past for us. So at this point, usually what happens with most people is they start waiting for the things around them to change. They start waiting for their job to get better. They start waiting for the relationship to get better. Always waiting for the other person. And this only leads to frustration and suffering. And if we don't change, if we don't make the changes, we will wind up in depression. And once we're there, we are stuck. There is no way out. It feels like a prison. And the only escape is literally a death of our ego. We need to experience an ego death. So the reason that when you're in a depression, it's so hard to make a decision it is, is because your mind, which is where your ego resides, is telling you to continue what you've been doing because you've been successful like that in the past. However, your heart, which is where your soul resides, is telling you that it's time to move on and it's time to do different things, that what you've been going through lately is not feeding you like it was before and it's time to let go. 
Now that's all quite theoretical, and I'd like to put it in real practical terms for you. Uh, there's a woman named Carolyn Mace who has a book called Anatomy of Spirit, Sacred Contracts, other books like that, and she approaches this whole problem in terms of our personal energy. And when you think about the depressions you go into, this loss of energy just seems to be the real emotional feeling, almost as if there's just nothing inside you to do anything anymore. And her model of the ego, uh, which basically corresponds to your level of consciousness, every level of consciousness has a separate, has a different ego, helps explain why we feel so bad uh, when we're in depression and how to get out of it. So according to Carolyn, every aspect of our life uh, we put energy into and it has a relationship, whether it's your car, your work, your family, money, friends, everything requires some investment. But for that relationship to be healthy, you need to be getting as much energy or more back from that relationship as you're putting into it. So if you take a look at Susan right here, Susan's doing great. Every aspect of her life seems to be feeding her in a positive way. Obviously, when you look at the stages of growth, she is in that newness stage, or maybe she's attached to the level where everything's going well. However, with any person that's growing, eventually she's going to find certain things that are not feeding her like they used to. Maybe her status car, her status, the status objects in her life that she's working so hard to pay for to impress her status friends are not really satisfying her on a deeper level. And the reason they're not satisfying her is because in her heart there's this higher level of consciousness that's calling her. It's a higher level that's asking her to lose these shallower pursuits. Now if Susan listens to her heart, she will make the changes necessary to move on. However, if she wants to hang on to what she's enjoyed in the past and she thinks rationally and logically about what she's doing, she will probably hang on and endure frustration and then suffering and then eventually she will enter into a depression. And in that depression, not only are the relationships that weren't feeding you going very well, but you can lose a taste for everything. You can lose a taste for your entire life, even the things that were going great. Now, Susan isn't the only one who's afraid to change. In the book Denial of Death by Ernest Becker, he wins a Nobel Prize by showing how humans are basically afraid to change because on a subconscious level, we associate letting go of old ways and old ideas with death. For us, change is the equivalent of death, and if you're afraid to die, you are literally afraid to live. However, Susan will eventually let go of what she needs to let go, provided that she doesn't take antidepressants, and with that, uh, there could be a period of mourning, especially for a big uh, loss, like losing a career or a divorce or something like that. However, eventually, what will happen is she will feel a surge of energy uh, that comes from this release of relationships that were not feeding her. Other sensations are that, again, this newness comes. There's an opening, a widening of your perspective, and very often a sense of synchronicities, almost like things are just coming together for you. So getting back to Susan, maybe she reprioritizes things. Maybe even with all this energy, she decides to lose her religion. Uh, she reprioritizes her life. She finds herself making more money. She invests in new relationships like a new puppy. Uh, she takes a bicycle to work instead of driving a fancy car. She puts her happiness ahead of her drive for success and maybe even uh, takes more vacations. You know, all this can come with this new leap of consciousness. Now going back to our theoretical model, you can see that this leap does require a dying of some sort, a dying of your ego death. And these deaths happen in our society. It's quite common to see people move from a traditional level of consciousness to a modern level or from a modern level to a postmodern. Now the role of antidepressants in this situation is just terrible because antidepressants stop you from feeling those painful feelings that will actually motivate you to change your life. So if you can't feel, you can't grow. Antidepressants numb the heart. Now many people talk about ending depression with diet and exercise or meditating and yoga and being connected with nature and I think all those practices are wonderful. But at the same time, I really believe that if those practices in your life are not leading to the kind of ego death changes that need to happen, you will never fully shake your depression. In order to move on, you really need to let go. 
In closing, I'd just like to say that if you're depressed out there, I would encourage you to look at this model that Carolyn Mace has uh, put forward and identify what relationships in your life are giving you interest on your energy and energizing you and which ones are not. And once you take a good look at it, you'll understand that those relationships that you're maintaining that are not satisfying you are the things that need to die. At the very least, they need to be transformed radically for you to grow in your life. Antidepressants are not the answer.